Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, we'll update the contempt of court hearing against Sheriff Joe Arpaio. Also tonight, we'll learn about the upcoming TEDx Phoenix talks, and we'll hear about a volunteer program that pairs children with seniors. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. Governor Doug Ducey today announced the appointment of Lisa Atkins as State Land Commissioner. Atkins is currently an executive of Greater Phoenix Leadership, a business advocacy group, and a member of the Central Arizona Project Governing Board. Atkins spent more than 20 years as Chief of Staff for former Arizona Congressman Bob Stump. Also today, the governor held a ceremonial signing of a bill that overhauls rules for ride-sharing businesses. The new law regulates drivers and requires uh, insurance, excuse me, vehicle inspections and liability insurance. Governor described the new law as a quote, significant measure to promote innovation. Well, Maricopa County Sheriff Joe Arpaio took the stand late this afternoon in day two of his contempt of court hearing. Arpaio is accused of violating court orders in a racial profiling case. Here with an update now on the hearing is local defense and civil rights attorney Scott Halverson. Good to see you again. Thank you so much for being Glad here. To be here. All you. right, let's start with, uh, again, late this afternoon. I thought this was going to happen tomorrow, but it happened today. Uh, the sheriff testifies. What yeah. did he say? Well, it initially he acknowledged that the, that the order was violated, that his office violated the order and that there should be consequences. But then after that, he proceeded to throw people under the bus. He basically said, I delegated this all to my counsel, to my subordinates, and basically if they didn't get it done, it's not my fault. So again, this is the sheriff here. This is supposed to be the leader of men and women in the department, and he's saying he had the what? What's he saying? He's basically saying that, uh, that the specific uh, compliance he delegated and uh, the ball was dropped, but, but you're right. I mean, he is at the top of the pyramid and, and he's the one ultimately responsible for, uh, for the policies being changed. He also admitted that he didn't consult with counsel to find out the specifics of what needed to be done uh, with regard to the order. Uh, was there a sense uh, from what he said that there was a, a bit of a dismissal of the order? Well, I don't think that he admitted that he was dismissing the order, but that's going to run counter to the audio and video testimony or video uh, evidence that was presented. I mean, there was a YouTube video presented that in fact showed Arpaio saying it's going to be business as usual. Interesting. Okay, so uh, he said obviously this was, this was the, 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 the court order was not followed. Not my fault. I thought X, Y, and Z was going to happen. Can't blame me for I mean, what about specific instances and conversations that have been brought up so far in testimony? Well, that's right, Ted. Uh, yesterday, uh, Sergeant Palmer testified that uh, within a month after the initial order was, was uh, issued, that there was an uh, instance where uh, some Hispanic uh, uh, occupants of the vehicle were, were pulled over. Um, there were three to five individuals that, in fact, they had no probable cause that any crime was committed other than them being here illegally, and, that, and that's a civil offense primarily. So um, it was Sergeant Palmer that said, I'm going to take these individuals down to, over to Customs and Border Patrol. Um, well, he got a call back from Sousa, his, his uh, supervisor, that said, call Arpaio on the cell phone right now. And Arpaio told him, don't release these individuals. And, and to his credit, Sergeant Palmer said, look, that's an unlawful order and I won't obey it. Um, at which time uh, Sergeant Palmer said that Arpaio said, uh, well, at least hold them until I get down there for a press conference. And again, um, Palmer said, no, I'm not going to do that. And Arpaio finally relented and said, at least take pictures of them, which was done. And then they were transported to the Casa Grande office of the Border Patrol. So again, and these were people who were not suspected of violating a state crime. That's right. And that's what the order said. The order basically said, um, the sheriff's office will not detain individuals that they don't have probable cause to suspect have committed a criminal act. And these were among others, though, that were suspected of, of what, of, of state violations? Yeah, yeah there were, the other individuals in the vehicle were arrested and detained properly because they, uh, they had probable cause to believe that those individuals violated the Arizona smuggling, anti-smuggling crime. Yeah. Yeah, um, it, and it sounded like one of the it sounded like Palmer's testimony included the statement that the doing so following the order would be contrary to goals and objectives of the sheriff. That's a bit of a bombshell statement. Yeah. Well, well, it is, and that's and he also said that about why that why hasn't the training been fully implemented? And he said, well, it's his understanding it was because it was contrary to the sheriff's um, uh, objectives and policies. So is this this bit of a smoking gun, isn't it? It, it is, and in, in response to that, when questioned today, though. Um, Sheriff Arpaio said, I just don't recall that conversation with Palmer. 
So, so you're talking about you're talking about a conversation on the cell phone with a guy who's basically telling you, "No, I'm not going to do what you tell me to do," and says it more than once, and hel not only says it, holds his ground, and you acquiesce, and he doesn't remember that. Yeah, apparently. So, and this apparently happened late at night. So it was a cell phone call in the middle of the night, somewhat of an urgent matter, I guess. So. The fact that the sheriff said he didn't under, didn't remember that is uh, somewhat difficult to believe. Do we have do we expect him back on the stand again tomorrow? Because he was supposed to be on tomorrow. Yeah, I mean it's unpredictable a little bit. The scheduling it's you know kind of goes it depends on the length of each witness. But um, yeah, I, had, I, I would hope and expect that he would uh, have something to say tomorrow as well. I know Brian Sands, another uh, a deputy, uh, I think a former deputy now of the department, uh, testified as well. And again, the idea being that. It wasn't his job, he says, to implement this court-ordered training regarding these traffic stops. Whose job was it? Yeah, well, that's the, that's the question. I mean, Arpaio is going to say, I delegate it to so-and-so and individuals, to Sands, and uh, if, if then Sands is saying, look, I, I never got that word, then again, this is mounting evidence against Arpaio. Is this the kind of thing where Arpaio can basically say, does, has he even hinted at the buck stops here? Has he, has he shown a sword that he could kind of follow? Well, I think he gave passing deference to that. I mean, I think in his initial, answering the initial question that he acknowledged that the, uh, that the, his office had violated, had failed to comply with the order. Um, I think he, he acknowledged also that the buck stops here, but, but after saying that, he then proceeded after that to, to then pass off the, uh, the responsibility for all of the violations onto his subordinates. And we also had, I think, and, and I want to get, kind of circle back in a second here, but I know that one of his attorneys uh, dropped out kind of today, Tom Liddy, because what, he, he also represented the county back in the original case, something along those lines? Yeah, and conflicts of interest can arise between, if, if you represent multiple clients and then related matters, then it, there are occasions where conflicts arise and you need to to avoid that by actually stopping your representation of both parties. And w is, could this be a problem now as far as the, this hearing going on? Could someone say that this has thrown the whole thing out of whack or? Well, I, I don't think so because um, Arpaio has his own personal counsel at this point that's, that's sitting beside him in the hearing. And so I think that he's covered. I don't think that he's now left without counsel. Um, I don't think there should be any, any problems with the transition. All right, before, it, it, let's stop right there and kind of go back because there are those I'm sure who don't even know what this is all about. We're talking about uh, Arpaio uh, delegating responsibility to following a court order and those underneath him saying, we never heard about this, we never even heard anything about it. He's now allegedly throwing these people under. What is this all about? Well, you know, the federal government doesn't really meddle in local affairs except when there are civil rights violations. And so when the evidence was presented initially to the court in 2011, they said, or, um, Judge Snow said, I'm gonna issue a preliminary injunction with at least some partial relief saying, look, you don't, you don't pull people over unless you have reasonable suspicion that they committed a crime. You can't pull them over because they're of some uh, ethnic background um, and you cannot hold people if you don't have probable cause. And so uh, then a, a long time passed where the dot discovery was done and in 2013, then there was a trial on the matter of whether there was a, 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 a class action, a basis for a class action of civil rights violations. And, uh, and it was found, the judge found it, yes, it, there was. There was a, there was a, a systemic problem of, of, of violating people's civil rights. So the judge then implemented a, a, more, a more comprehensive order. And that's what we're arguing about today. I mean, that's what they're presenting evidence about today. Um, it, and the question is, is it civil contempt or criminal contempt? Uh, criminal contempt is basically for some egregious violation of a court order in the past, uh, sort of a punishment. Civil contempt would be then to say, look, you're, you're not complying with this order. We're going to punish you or coerce you to compliance. Is there a sense, though, that this judge has basically had it with that line of thinking? Well, I, I, I think that... Um, I think that the, the, what the evidence has been presented, I think, is speaking much louder than, than uh, the defenses that are raised by, by Arpaio. I mean, I think that hearing Sheridan, his chief deputy Sheridan, um, calling the, the uh, order ludicrous and crap, uh, basically in a video that was, that was taken during a training session before an interdiction patrol, uh, and that was just short time after the order, that's, that's, it's difficult to imagine that that's can be overlooked. Well, if, and if it's not overlooked, what happens? I mean, could, or could we see criminal charges brought up against the sheriff? Well, criminal contempt, I, you know, jail could be imposed on either criminal or civil contempt. Criminal contempt, it would be a punishment for, for something that's been done. And that's not, it, it's unlikely, I think, but not out of the realm of possibility. Then 
Um, more likely it would be, if the jail's imposed, it would be um, jail imposed to ensure compliance. And then once compliance has is, is been, uh, been met, then, uh, then basically a person's released from jail. And again, I don't, I don't expect that to happen. Fines are more likely. Fine, yeah, but you know, you got your fines and you got your orders and you've still got video and public statements of this is crap and we're not gonna do this and I'm gonna do things my way because I'm the sheriff of all the people. I yeah. mean, at what, point does, at what point does this court order get followed. Yeah, yeah, well, and that's what the judge is going to be thinking. What, you know, didn't you think I meant what I said? I mean, this is a federal court order that you need to follow. No one's above the law, not even a, a local sheriff. And so, well, um, while, while Judge Snow is not elected official, uh, he's not elected to be sheriff. Nevertheless, um, he has the authority to step in and, and, and put requirements, basically monitor and, and to some extent require administration in certain ways of the uh, sheriff's office. Real quickly before you go, as far as today, obviously he was on the stand and uh, just basically said as little it seems like as possible. Yesterday when Palmer and the smoking gun regarding the, the conversation, a phone call and conversation, what, did you see his reaction at all? Was he? Was he... I couldn't. I couldn't. I mean, he's, he's facing sideways in, in the court, uh, sitting up at council table, and so unfortunately I couldn't. I'd love to see what his expression was. Were, was everyone else kind of surprised that this kind of information was coming out? Well, I, I think it was, I think the ACLU attorneys were chomping at the bit to get this in front of Judge Snow, uh, just because they, they relished the thought of Judge actually hearing what's really going on behind the scenes. All right. Scott, good stuff. Good to have you here. Thank you so much for joining My us. My pleasure. TEDx Phoenix brings the inspirational ideas of TED Talks to the Mesa Art Center this Sunday. Some of the guests at this year's event will include Emmy-winning and Academy Award-nominated filmmaker Bristol Bond, research fellow and geneticist Rachel Bloom, and storm chaser Camille Seaman. Storm chasing is a very tactile experience. There's a warm, moist wind blowing at your back, and the smell of the earth, the wheat, the grass, the charged particles. And then there are the colors in the clouds of hail forming the greens and the turquoise blues. I've learned to respect the lightning. My hair used to be straight. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, joining us now to talk about this year's TEDx Phoenix event is one of the lead organizers, Warda Jamil. Good to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Um, what? Give me a better definition of TEDx Phoenix. Sure. Um, so TEDx Phoenix is an event that's licensed by the TED Conference. And what it is is um, we bring together the leading thinkers and doers in the Valley to come together for a good conversation and an evening of, of talks by insi inspiring people. You mentioned uh, licensed by the TED Conference. Mm -hmm. What is TED? So TED stands for Technology, Entertainment, and Design. And TED is a nonprofit and a conference that happens annually in Vancouver. They make their talks available online um, for free at TED.com. And um, they've had luminaries such as Bill Gates and Al Gore. Oh, some of those things have, are just tremendous to, to, to sit through and listen through. As far as now this event, the theme is called Press Play. What, mm -hmm. what is that all about? So we chose the theme Press Play because we kind of envision it as a reboot of TEDx Phoenix. And as a larger encompassing part of that for our speakers, um, Ted Press Play is a, a look at ignoring the odds, drowning out the noise, and really choosing your own adventure. And when you say reboot, uh, mm -hmm. did, I, I know we had one in 2013. Did we have one last year? No, we didn't have one last year. So it's a volunteer run event. Mm -hmm. um, so when we have the support that we need, 
that really gives us the, the drive to keep moving forward. And we took a year off to kind of def define what is the vision of TEDx Phoenix, where is this going, and how can we come back, and how are we going to come back? So you're coming back, and um, obviously ignore the noise or ignore the odds and choose your own adventure and mm -hmm. drown out the noise and all stuff. And we just saw amazing photographs and a very interesting speaker talking about storm chasing. How does that speaker fit into this theme? So Camille is very interesting. She's a, a National Geographic uh, photographer. And for her, she picked up one day and decided she was going to hit uh, the North Pole and just kind of got some stuff from REI and headed up there. And her baggage got lost, but she still made it up there. And she's very much a person that chooses her own adventure. So she fits in a lot with with that choosing your own adventure part. And, and you also have a tornado tracker as well, is that true? Yes, she's an atmospheric scientist, Karen, and she tracks tornadoes and she gets into little vehicles and chases storms. Yeah, yeah. Uh, another speaker I thought was very interesting, uh, she basically had her toddler dress her yeah. for a week and then <laughs> blogged about it. What's, what's going on here? Summer Valesa is a very brave woman. Um, she had her toddler style her and then she wore that clothing out and about doing errands and she actually filmed people um, expressions as she was walking by in these outfits. And were the outfits just just oh, what a toddler would think would look nice or? Yeah, she had a sequin skirt and some cheetah print <laughs> loafers. <laughs> so. And this thing went viral, didn't it? Her, her, uh, her blog on this went viral? Yeah, it was all over, I believe, NBC and Reddit and, and Babbel where she originally wrote the article. Now you've got an Academy Award nominated and uh, I think Emmy winning uh, filmmaker as well. Mm -hmm. Talk to us about that. Uh, so Bristol is actually the co-founder of Good Magazine and is also an Emmy winning uh, videographer, producer. Um, she made a, a video about uh, teenage race car drivers. <laughs> well, I see. And again, these people, it's not just what they do, mm -hmm. they talk about what they do. Absolutely. They're, they're experts in their field, but they're also great storytellers, and that's why I re really want to feature them. How do, you, how do you pick who to feature and who not to feature? How does that work? That's a very good question. Um, so it's a meticulous curation process. We look for someone who obviously is an expert in their field. We also look for, is that field current? Is it now? Are they getting press? And are they a good storyteller? Because that's what it's all about. I noticed you had a comedian on the list as well. Now, how does a comedian fit into all this? So he has a very interesting story about tolerance, and he's going to be sharing that on Sunday. So, so that's it. You're not going to tell me anything more, huh? I can't because if I tell you anything more, I'll give, give you uh, the punchline. Okay. So um, and th there's more than just these folks standing on a stage and giving out these TED Talks that we see on, on TED.com and stuff like this. Absolutely. Uh, talk about the other events that are going on, other things that are happening at the event, I should say. Absolutely. So it's also about um, conversation. So we want uh, Phoenicians to come together talk, see the talks, but then talk about the talks and perhaps how we can incorporate those ideas within our own communities to put something actionable behind it uh, to do more good. And there's food, there's drink, there's musical entertainment, so it's really an all-encompassing event. I was going to say, what do you want people to take from an event like this? I mean, they, if, first of all, what do, you expo what do people expect when they go there and what do you want them to expect once they leave? I think um, a lot of people perhaps come in with no expectations and we want to blow them away, um, ultimately. We want them to feel inspired, um, to feel as if they can do things, as in they can um, make change. Um, we want them to help Phoenix get to the forefront of the national conversations and global conversations that are happening about the world's most pressing issues. And there are, are there like TEDx Denver's, TEDx Seattle's, Absolutely. these sorts of things out there? Absolutely, there are thousands of TEDx events all over the world. And, and again, your group, mm -hmm. you're involved, how'd you get involved? So I started out as a volunteer back when TEDx Phoenix first started in 2009, uh, and since then um, got more and more involved um, and help, ended up helping with organizing. So we really have a passionate group of volunteers and it's a completely volunteer run effort. It sounds like it's a completely volunteer effort, but it, I mean, someone's got to find, uh, you know, uh, get the stage set, someone's got to get uh, everything organized here. Where's the money coming from? So the money um, comes from ticket sales, and then we have very generous partners and sponsors who help us as well, who really are part of the event as well. Is that one of the reasons we didn't have one last year? Was it kind of hard to wrangle that up at the time, or wh what happened last year? So I think a lot of it has to do with just getting enough volunteers and having enough time to pr sort of plan events that take such time. Since mm -hmm. it's not necessarily a conference, it's not 
you know, a theater play of any sort. So with all the details, it takes a little time to put all that together. It sounds like it's kind of a, 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 a glorified lecture, isn't it? I mean, it used to be some guy would come through town and lecture about how he went to Africa and, and shot a rhino or something like that. Now it's, it's all these ideas. It's kind of the same form, isn't it? Um, I would say that at its heart, it's about storytelling. Mm -hmm. We all love storytelling, right? Yes. Since the dawn of, of time, um, Aesop's fables, uh, we love to hear stories. And so if people can connect their fields with stories, that is so powerful. Okay, when and where is this event? It is Sunday, this coming Sunday, April 26th at 2 p.m. at the Mesa Arts Center. All right, sounds fun. Congratulations, good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Thousands of experienced adults across the country are working to make a difference in their communities through the program called uh, Experience Counts, I believe is what it's called. Producer Christina Estes shows us how the program is paying off in the classroom. Sharks have lived in the world. Think of something to do. Cuckoo, cuckoo, cuckoo. We have about 608 students here at Frank in pre-K through fifth grade. About 40 of them meet with their reading buddies twice a week. Good. They're more formally known as members of AARP's Experience Corps, volunteers who are trained to help students read better. I've been involved for about five years. This is my fifth year. Nat Tinkler is kind of the ringleader. He recruited four other retirees in his neighborhood. You mark, get set, go. They're young, they're so uh, impressionable, and uh, they're a lot of fun. They just, so I get, I get a lot of enjoyment out of that. But this is more than a feel-good program, according to Principal Martha Huckabo-Smith. They do an amazing job. They read nonfiction text. They work on phonics, on vocabulary, comprehension, fluency, text endurance. They ask all those important questions related to the text that children need to know in order to comprehend and to grow academically. She says tests show students are improving their reading skills. Very good job. And there's another bonus. They're gaining confidence. We can see it in them. We can see the conversations they have with the tutors. We can see the children wanting to read more text. I've stopped in a few times when they're reading with the children. Um, and children will be eager to share what they have read. Many people are afraid of sharks, but... I think it's important that, especially uh, us seniors who have the time, should be able to uh, offer our assistance, whether it be in school, in a school setting or in a business setting, why um, it's important that we give back a little bit. While giving back is a priority for Howard Shapiro, he admits it's not all fun and games. And like most teachers, he looks forward to summer break. Well, there's a lot of repetition. Okay, a couple more pages, come on. Everybody's different. We're gonna read it together, you and me at the same Are time. Are baby turtles? Those are baby turtles on that page. We'll get there in just a second. Let's read this. Where Does the pencil disappear again? Patience is key. <laughs> Go ahead, read. The payoff so, comes from knowing they're making a difference. So it gives you a sense that, uh, you know, their kids are going to be successful. They'll, they'll be able to accomplish something. And sometimes it comes from learning new words. As one of my little girls says, easy peasy lemon squeezy. And is the shark book easy peasy lemon squeezy? Yeah, yeah. kind of. When the school year ends, these volunteers and students will share a lifelong lesson, that friendship 
like reading, is fundamental. Was that fun? You did very well. I was very proud of your reading today. It was very good. For more information, check out Experience Corps' website at aarp.org slash experience dash core. We want to hear from you. Submit your questions, comments, and concerns via email at arizonahorizon at asu.edu. Thursday on Arizona Horizon, we'll have another update of the contempt of court hearing against Sheriff Joe Arpaio, and we'll visit the Musical Instrument Museum as it celebrates its fifth anniversary. That's on the next Arizona Horizon. That's it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thanks for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.